The World Council of Churches is holding a world conference on church and society in Geneva, Switzerland. According to the Associated Press, lavish praise of atheistic China and open support for Christian violence to achieve social change were just two of the shock features in the first week. A young American theologian from Princeton Theological Seminary created a stir by advocating violence for revolutionary groups such as American Civil Rights Movement. According to the Associated Press, he said there was sometimes the only way of achieving social change in the face of a self-satisfied, indifferent power structure of a contented society. The Associated Press also reports that some of the officials of the World Council of Churches are pleased with the revolutionary remarks made during the conference. After reading this report, I could not help wondering where the Lord Jesus Christ was in all of this. With our television screens filled with pictures of rioting, looting, killing, and violence in various American cities this summer, we have the spectacle of an American theologian calling for more violence in order to achieve social ends. It seems that some church leaders are willing to go even further than the humanist and the secularist in announcing the death of God and now calling for violence. How different from the attitude of Christ, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. How different from the admonitions of the Apostle Paul who said, let us have no imitation Christian love. Let us have a genuine break with evil and a real devotion to good. Let us have real warm affection for one another as between brothers and a willingness to let the other man have the credit. When trials come, endure them patiently, he said. Steadfastly maintain the habit of prayer. And as for those who try to make your life a misery, bless them. Don't curse, bless. Live in harmony with one another, said Paul. Don't pay back a bad turn for a bad turn. As far as your responsibility goes, live at peace with everyone. Never take vengeance into your own hands, my dear friends, he said. Stand back and let God punish if he will. The Apostle Paul continues, and I'm quoting from Philip's translation, Don't allow yourselves to be overpowered with evil. Take the offensive. Overpower evil by good. Every Christian, he said, ought to obey the civil authorities, for all legitimate authority is derived from God's authority, and the existing authority is appointed unto God. To oppose authority, said Paul, is to oppose God, and such opposition is bound to be punished. Certainly the church is to be concerned about the social injustices in our world. Even a casual study of the life of Jesus reveals that he was interested in man's response to the social problems he faced. Since Jesus Christ walked the earth, the thinking of the world concerning social matters has changed radically. Because of him, the world witnessed a new reverence for human life and learned something of the dignity and worth of man. Three out of every five men whom Paul passed on the streets of Rome were slaves. It was Christ's assertion that every individual has immeasurable value in the sight of God. And it was this message that helped eventually to free the slaves. He said of how much more value is a man than a sheep. It was Jesus who taught us that every man is a potential child of God. When he lived on earth, no one was his special pet, whether on account of riches or of poverty. Rank and social distinction meant nothing to him. It was for man as man that Christ cared. Because of Jesus, woman has been lifted to her present position. In much of ancient literature, woman was regarded as little more than an animal. As a result of the coming of Christ Jesus, thousands of Christians through the ages have given their lives to help their neighbor, to relieve poverty, to care for the sick. Most hospitals, orphanages, institutions for the poor, and asylums have their origin in him. The social conscience of man was deepened by the coming of Christ. Why then is the world in such a desperate plight, you ask? The answer is because it will not come to Jesus Christ that it might have life. The world has rejected him. To be sure, part of its conscience is still with Jesus, but not its conduct. Christ can save the world only as he is living in the hearts of men and women. We talk glibly about the establishment of the Christian order of society through legislation and social engineering and even now by violence, as though we could bring it down from the skies if only we worked and fought hard enough. Ladies and gentlemen, the kingdom of God will never come that way. If the human race should suddenly turn to Christ, 
we would have immediately the possibility of a new Christian order. We could approach our problems in the framework of Christian understanding and brotherhood. To be sure, the problems would remain, but the atmosphere for their solution would be completely changed. If we are going to touch the inner city life of our communities, we must know their sorrows and feel for them in their trials and temptations and stand with them in their heartbreaks. Jesus Christ entered into the arena of our troubles and he wept with them that wept and rejoiced with them that rejoiced. Any man who cares enough to want to bless the lives of people must somehow sit where they sit. This is the reason that I have such an interest in those who are working in the inner city churches. It is probably the most frustrating ministry in America and Canada today to face teeming areas of people of different ethnic groups living in substandard housing, thousands of them unemployed. Religious ideas have little meaning for many of them. Their lives are disorganized. The inner city pastor faces all their frustrations and tries with compassion to enter into their problems. However, having said that, we must remember that they are still people. And as people, they're sinners before God. We are making the mistake of blaming all their troubles on an impersonal society that we think has done them a terrible injustice. And in many cases they have, but this is not the total problem. It's true that there are terrible social injustices that need to be righted, but this is not the whole problem. The basic problem was pointed out by Jesus when he said, Far from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, indecency, envy, slander, pride, and folly. He said all these things come from within, and they defile the man. Jesus indicated that our problem is heart trouble. The greatest need of our great cities at this moment is evangelism. The Apostle Paul stood in the heart of pagan, secular, immoral, and violent Corinth and said, we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The proclamation of the gospel is still the desperate need of men today. We are never going to reverse the moral trends of America without a spiritual awakening, and we're never going to have a spiritual awakening until the cross of Jesus Christ is central in all our teaching and preaching. David Brainerd, in his journal of his life and doings amongst the American Indians, said, I never got away from Jesus and him crucified. And I found that when my people were gripped by this great evangelical doctrine of Christ and him crucified, I had no need to give them instructions about morality. I found that one followed as sure and inevitable fruit of the other. Dorothy Sayers says, We've been trying for several centuries to uphold a particular standard of ethical values which derives from Christian dogma while gradually dispensing with the very dogma which is the sole foundation for those values. If we want Christian behavior, then we must realize that Christian behavior is rooted in Christian belief. James Stewart, professor of New College in Edinburgh, says, The driving force of the early Christian mission was not propaganda of beautiful ideas of the brotherhood of man. It was the proclamation of the mighty acts of God. At the very heart of the apostles' message stood the divine, redemptive, paid on Calvary. Ladies and gentlemen, if the church wants high moral standards in the nation and a new social justice, then let the church get back to preaching the simple, authoritative gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. It was this gospel that brought about many of the great social reforms of the past. The preaching of the cross and the resurrection have been primarily responsible for promoting humanitarian sentiment and social concern during the last 400 years. Prison reform, the prohibition of the slave trade, the abolition of slavery, the factory acts, the protection of children, the crusade against cruelty to animals are the outcome of great religious awakenings brought about by the proclamation of the gospel. Dr. F. L. Folks Jackson, the distinguished church historian, says, History shows that the thought of Christ on the cross has been more potent than anything else in arousing a compassion for suffering and indignation at injustice. But what are we witnessing today? Many of our ecclesiastical organizations are making resolutions, pronouncements, and lobbying to bring into being and enforce the social changes envisioned by church leaders as a part of the world where the church shall be the dominating influence. When most major Protestant denominations have their annual councils, assemblies, or conventions, they make pronouncements on matters having to do with disarmament, 
federal aid to education, birth control, the United Nations, and any number of social and political issues. I'm not finding fault with this. However, the pendulum has swung too far, and the emphasis is now being misplaced. Very rarely are resolutions passed that have to do with the redemptive witness of the gospel. We've been trying to solve every ill of society as though society were made up of truly Christian men to whom we had an obligation to speak with Christian advice. We are beginning to realize that while the law must guarantee human rights and restrain those who violate those rights, whenever men lack sympathy for the law, they will not long respect it, even when they cannot repeal it. Thus, the government may try to legislate Christian behavior, but it soon finds that man remains unchanged. The changing of men is the primary mission of the church. The only way to change men is to get them converted to Jesus Christ. Then they will have the capacity to live up to the Christian command to love thy neighbor. There's no doubt that today we see social injustice everywhere. However, looking on our American scene, Jesus would see something even deeper. He would say, beware of covetousness because of the spirit of perpetual discontent with what life offers. Forever wanting more, forever looking at other people's conditions in life and never being content. If only we in the church would begin at the root of our problems, which is the disease of human nature that the Bible calls sin. This is why Christ came and died on the cross. This is why he shed his blood to do something about this disease that mankind is suffering from. However, we in the church today are in danger of becoming blundering social physicians, giving medicine here and putting ointment there on the sores of the world. But the sores break out again somewhere else. The great need is for the church to call in the great physician, who alone can properly diagnose the case. He will look beneath the mere skin eruptions and pronounce on the cause of it all, sin. If we in the church want a cause to fight, let's fight sin. Let's reveal its hideousness. Let's show that Jeremiah was correct when he said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Then when the center of man's trouble is dealt with, when this disease is eradicated, then and only then can we point to men the cure for the disease, which is Christ in him crucified. And when men receive him, then they can live as man with man and brother with brother. I believe in taking a stand on moral, social, and spiritual issues of our day. I've used this radio program, The Hour of Decision, for years to preach on every social issue I can think of. I've talked on everything from bad housing to highway safety. However, the social issue of our day has not been the main theme of my preaching. My main theme has been the same as that of the early apostles that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I've just come from Europe, where several countries have what is called the welfare state. Allegedly, the social problems of these countries have been solved. However, church leaders are beginning to realize that man cannot live by bread alone. They are beginning to realize that man has deeper spiritual needs that only Christ can minister to. That is the reason why thousands flock to Earl's Court in London for four and a half weeks to hear the gospel. And over 42,000 of them responded to the appeal to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. You today need Christ. Many of you that are listening to my voice have social security. Many of you listening to my voice may be termed wealthy, but you too have found that man shall not live by bread alone. You need Christ to help meet the inner needs of your life, the boredom, the lack of satisfaction, the lack of purpose in your life. You need Christ to give a purpose. You need Christ to give that new dimension that is called eternal life. Will you receive him today as your Lord and your Savior? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank Thee that we have a gospel to preach at this hour. We thank Thee that in the midst of a revolutionary world, there is Christ, His death and His resurrection. The good news that He's willing to forgive sin and change lives and transform society. And we pray that we in the church will be faithful to that gospel. Lord, we thank Thee for this ministry of the hour of decision, that the opportunities we have Sunday by Sunday of proclaiming Christ in him crucified. We pray that we shall ever be true and faithful to this gospel. For we ask it in his name. Amen.